This video is going to be my first off-season film study look at the Detroit Lions offense from the standpoint of what exactly is the Ben Johnson offense in Detroit. I want to try to get to the heart of that matter in a series of videos. This one's going to focus on two particular situations where things that Ben Johnson and the Lions do I think are anomalous compared to the rest of the NFL. Unfortunately, I have to mention or at least address how many people refer to offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, or head coaches in the NFL in terms of what they do and how that relates to the Detroit Lions offense is the conversation. What what coaching tree does Ben Johnson come from? Personally, I find those conversations to be not only off base, but just outright boring. But many other people seem to be occupied with them, with them as it relates to various coaches in the NFL and college football. Does someone come from the Shanahan tree, the Bill Walsh? Well, some of you are probably too old for that. The Bill Walsh tree, Andy Reid, McVay. Which coaching tree does Ben Johnson come from, and how does that categorize his offense? I just don't think that that's the way to look at it. I feel like it's got to be film-based, at least for me, to have any level of understanding. I feel like those things are just conversation points to fill airtime or, te or television time. I think he does things that nobody else in the NFL is doing, one of which I'll focus on in this video, two that I'll mention. And the offense that the Lions are running is its own entity. I think it's a byproduct of, you know, what type of st what style Dan Campbell wants to see, but also Ben Johnson's mind preparation, and, it, and it's coordinated with all those things in mind. It's its, its own system. I don't think it's cookie-cutter like so much of the of the concepts the NFL runs. Look, there's commonalities, don't get me wrong, but I want to illustrate at least one stark difference here before the film starts, and that is uh, Ben Johnson's steadfast commitment to, to the run game, to, to the point where he's almost forced defenses to worry about run plays on each and every snap, including third and 12. I also think there is a, a real possibility, as a side note here, that some of the things he's doing uh, might be copied by other NFL teams, and that's running the football on third down. An another difference, and I'll expand on that, that thought I uh, just made in a moment uh, with the film, but another stark difference, if you ask me, is the usage of a star wide receiver, and this one I'm in Ross St. Brown. Look, if, if people don't rec – you're a Lions fan if you're listening this long, but other people, if they don't recognize how different – the expectations are for St. Brown. They're, they're just not paying close enough attention, that's all. St. Brown's a guy who has over 300, 315 catches, I think, precisely, in his three-year career in the regular season. 21 touchdowns. Not only is he expected to do all of those things, he's got, he's got a block like a typical wide receiver. He also lines up at running back often, and not only does he get the ball in his hands, he actually blocks from that position at times. I, I will start with third down run concepts here, but I feel like I had to mention that is a drastic departure from the way that the rest of the NFL handles star wide receivers, even those on rookie contracts, which St. Brown still is at this point. We'll get the film started here with third down run concepts, although some of You've heard me talk about it, I'm sure. Ben Johnson's willingness to run the ball on third down, and I'm sure other content creators or commenters, evaluators, have discussed it as well. What's he doing? He's opening up a wider net of possibilities on third down and forcing defenses to adapt such that I expect other teams to do this next year because there's a it's a copycat league. But I do believe the league can be slow to adjust at times, and what I mean is generally the imitation occurs a year later in the NFL, when coaches have been able to study those concepts and situations without having an upcoming, up, upcoming opponent to focus on. Uh, so I guess we'll see when the 2024 season begins if more coaches are willing to expand that, that run-pass conflict for the defense on third and six, on third and four. Do I expect anybody to do what Ben Johnson does and run it on third and 12 in an NFC championship game? Well, no, but I'll explain that play in particular. I think it's um. I think his favorite play calls are on third down. I really do. I guess some people would say it's on first down. I hope you like the video. We're going to start with run concepts first, and then the pass plays last. I do have more analysis already completed, but this video is going to be quite long. 
I doubt anyone, even you, if you've listened this long, as a hardcore Lions fan, want to sit through a 90-minute video. So we'll break this up. And hopefully you'll gain some understanding of, of what Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell are doing on third down that makes them so good. This is a fourth down play against the against the uh, Eagles by the Lions in week one of 2022 that I'm just letting flow. Last point about third downs. Detroit finished eighth in the league in 2023 on third down conversions. Almost 42%, just a tick below 42%. That's up slightly from their almost 41% in 2022 in Ben Johnson's first year as offensive coordinator. And that's with a quarterback in Jared Goff who is rarely able to scramble for a first down or create things outside of the play call. So I think their success on third down is notable, number one. Number two, I think part of it is by design in terms of running the ball on third downs keeping the defense honest. Now, you know, I'm getting away with one here by making this the first play to show you, but I feel like I have to. I feel like it's foundational. This is fourth and one. You've seen it multiple times flow through at this point. I first became aware of this play uh, in an in a unusual manner. After week one of 2022, I actually watched this game, but I, I will be forthright. I was not interested in the Lions at all at that point, to be real. Between 2021 and 2022, I had done two videos on Jalen Hurts and how I thought his rookie year had shown lots of promise. Even though their playoff loss down in Tampa Bay, things did not look great. I watched the All-22 of this game after week one, maybe midweek, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I just laughed when I saw this. It's a fourth and one in the first half. And, and look, nobody uses split backs in the NFL. This is split backs here. Now, one of them is a tight end. And, the, and he's lined up closer. It's quite obvious to us now at this point what play is being run because we've seen this so many times, and I'll show you multiple versions of it um, as we go through here. But this is a, consider this an establishing shot. Week 1, 2022, first game as offensive coordinator. This is first half. We, look, we all know what the rest of the NFL thought about this play. Well, at least one team, Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy and the Chiefs, used this same exact play, same exact formation, against the Eagles in the Super Bowl that year. Forgive me for that. I didn't mean to click forward. It's jumbo 13 personnel. So you've got a tight end and an eligible offensive lineman as tight ends there, as two tight ends there. A third one, one running back. In this case, it's Swift, who's obviously since moved on. The thing that I'm seeing about this now is Ben Johnson's usage of it has expanded. It's um, evolved, if you will. He's running it a lot more out of 11 personnel. I'm going to move forward to the third and 12 against the 49ers. I'll come back to that split backs stuff here in a little bit. Again, consider these first two establishing shots. This, I think, is illustrates the just absolute audacity and brilliance of what Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell are willing to do in certain situations. I'm not talking about going for it on fourth down. I'm simultaneously talking about the concepts they use and when they use them. This is third and 12 in the NFC title game. They've confirmed that it's man defense with St. Brown moving across the formation. And then look at the D-line configuration. You've got three to the top, the boundary side of the field. One D-end or D-lineman to the bottom side is Chase Young. Laporta motions over immediately, and that brings Warner with him. Also, and I'll let this play a couple of times, check out golf. A slapping his left arm repeatedly, that is counter left, in my opinion. But once they've motioned him over, this is pure manipulation of the defense. Look at, if you cut the uh, field in half, which it doesn't really work cutting it in half, but the formation cut in half, consider that line to be like at the, at the player's feet, if you will. You've only got four available players down here to defend to this side. Now, I'm counting that guy. He really counts for half to each side in terms of a numerical count. Actually, actually be done uh, on the football field or, or on the whiteboard, I should say, by coaches. I do not think this was originally a run play. Goff taps his left arm repeatedly. That's counter left, at least this week. So credit to him for adjusting so quickly. Gibbs, Laporta, Reynolds all have to adjust their assignment. But look, Goff is on it. He's recognizing the coverage and the defensive alignment as one that's advantageous for the Lions to run the football to the left. This video is about Ben Johnson. So are you going to credit Ben Johnson for this? Yes, he deserves more credit for this. 
Imagine that the 49ers had three defensive linemen down to this side and only one up here. It's difficult to do that. I don't have the editing skills to make these two players disappear or shift to the other side. Ben Johnson created a structure, a system where Goff, Gibbs, Laporta, Reynolds, and the offensive line, and St. Brown, all knew what to do immediately after the check. Now you say, well, coach, that's what every NFL offensive coordinator does. That's true, but they're not all running the ball on counter on third and 12 after absolute manipulation of the defense because their quarterback is smart enough to understand the coverage, and he knows, oh, if I move Laporta over, I get this linebacker out of the way. So conceptually, you've moved Laporta away from the point of attack, tight end, and you moved St. Brown to the point of attack, wide receiver. Why? Fred Warner's to the other side. You're running it away from him. I do wonder how much of this will be copied by the rest of the league. There's, look, on some level, there are people who, whether it's a, a coach in sports, whether it's at your job, whatever, there are some people who would rather fail doing what they're supposed to do, following the status quo. I'm going to fail doing the status quo throw on everything third and three or longer, fail sometimes, rather than invest in what I think is a long-term strategy here to keep the defense defense honest. That's what I'm trying to sell to you um, in this video or or trying to point out to you, I guess. I've made my mind up that this is a long-term strategy by Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell to keep the defense honest and show people at the highest level, if you do this and you allow yourself to be manipulated, you're in trouble. I think it's a brilliant strategy overall. Obviously, Penay Sewell was getting out here to pick up a key block, so you've got to have a right tackle who's quick enough and athletic enough to do that. I think this stuff is amazing. Maybe it's my own limited understanding of the game of football at this point, but nobody else does this, if you ask me. And Tony Romo actually said that um, after this play. This is week 13, fourth and five against the Chargers. So the concept of running on third down, reaches or extends to fourth down as well. So Ben Johnson and Ben Johnson you ha- and Dan Campbell, you have a guy who's not just willing to risk criticism for running on third and five and perhaps having to settle for a field goal. Here they are running trap, an anomalous technique anyway in the NFL, and doing it on fourth and five. There might be a few brave offensive coordinators that will run on third and five or third and seven in, in an NFC title game. Not many but there's a few, I guess. There's only one that I know of that's willing to call trap on fourth and five at that level, and and that's Ben Johnson. Me personally, I enjoy rooting for people who who go against the green, and you probably do too on some level, either either in sports or whatever your profession is. I, I absolutely think that the Chargers' defensive tackle, number 56, knows what's coming here. At this point, this late in the season, Ben Johnson's second year as offensive coordinator, one and a half at this point, I guess, at the time of this video or time of this game being played. Certainly there's awareness from a defensive standpoint. I think the I think 56 actually looks over and sees the left guard, Jackson, check with the right guard. Now check I think the right guard shifting his left hand back like that is communication to the left guard about alignment. I think he's signaling this is a a short trap because 56 is in a three, meaning if if 56, is his feet are here, outside shade of the guard, if his feet was here, he was in a one or a shade, whatever you want to call it, then maybe they'd be trapping the next guy out, the, the next guy out from him because the guard would just take him down and they wouldn't be leaving him unblocked to trap in the first place. Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. Look, it's so loud here in the stadium, I'm sure on a fourth and five, you had to visually confirm there as opposed to communicating uh, verbally. So instead of trapping the next guy out, you, you really couldn't anyway. I mean, look, Khalil Mack is way out here, and you have Derwin James head up on the tight end, Sam Laporta, uh, basically playing man. It's fourth and five. So Khalil Mack's thinking about rushing, pass, rushing the passer. The Lions are playing a different game. Not only the trap concept. It's one of the best concepts to get a defensive end or a D-tackle who's running up field and run inside of them. Now, to the inside gap. Now, 56 knows that game. And he tries to trap the trapper here. 
Trap the trapper. Get your get your outside shoulder to the inside shoulder of the trapper. Trap him. Montgomery reads it perfectly. Instead of taking this downhill into this space, he's going to bounce it outside the trap block, which you're not supposed to do, or you really don't want to do. Let's phrase it that way. But because Mac is lined up so wide, even though he's getting away from Laporta quite quickly, he's too wide. After defeating Laporta's block easily, he's a half step too late because of his alignment. That's the beauty of what they're doing, if you ask me. The rest of the NFL will comply on third and five. Or I know this is fourth down. Let me get away with calling it third and five. We've got a handshake agreement here between the offense and the defense, generally. Third and five. You know we're passing. We know you know we're passing. Let's find out who's better at this game. Let's find out who's better at pass pro. Let's find out who's better at running routes. Let's find out who's better at covering. And look, the Lions can play that game often as well. They've got talent to be able to do that. Here they are retaining the ability to change up that dynamic on these third or fourth downs where Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell uh, march their guys to a different beat. I think it's one of the most unique and fun situations to try to evaluate from 2023 for me. That's why I'm spending so much time talking about it. Perhaps um, your connection to the game is different than mine, or perhaps your perspective on these things is different. It certainly would be if m the majority of them failed. The fact of the matter is the majority, majority of them have not failed. They have succeeded. And you can see from these last two examples where sometimes it's a check, like the one against the 3rd and 12 against the 49ers in the NFC Championship game. Most often, it's a play call pre-snap in the huddle uh, like the one that you just saw. Moving on, this is week 15, third and 10, third quarter at home against the Broncos. It's a game I still find interesting to look at and, and think about and read things on. I Sometimes I'll go back and read previews of games because so much conversation leading up to this was about the Broncos being a team um, on a roll, a potential playoff team. They won seven of eight or maybe six of seven at that point. I actually got Twitter messages from non-Lions fans leading up to this game saying, hey, I think your Lions are in trouble. And I respond professionally to those things because that at this point I'm trying to make this a profession. Broncos are on a roll. They're going to walk in there and beat up the Lions. Okay, they're going to physically beat up Detroit. And then everything the Lions did on offense was working. It's so a third and ten, like I said, third quarter. They did rack up 450 yards of offense in this game, including 185 on the ground. So this one, to me, on a third and 10 in the third quarter is a little bit surprising because everything they were doing was working. I feel like Ben Johnson's usage of this at times is reserved for big moments. And this being in the third quarter of a game that Detroit ended up winning 42-17 is, is a little anomalous for him. But think about it this way. The Lions went punt, punt, punt to open the game. So they didn't get a thing done offensively in the first three possessions. And then they shredded Detroit's defense in the second quarter to take a 21-0 lead. This is third quarter after the Broncos went down and scored to make it 21-7. So we're about five minutes into the third quarter, 10 minutes left roughly. So the situation isn't determined in terms of who's going to win. And that's my point. I feel like Ben Johnson goes to these things when they need them. He saves them for big moments. He does them infrequently enough. That's probably a poorly worded phrase. I don't even know if you're allowed to do that. He does them infrequently enough such that defenses, even though they're prepared for them, are not able to stop them. Let's look at the um, end zone angle of this one. <clears throat> Another thing to notice here is it's not necessarily a trap play. I would call this down because it's a front side guard that's kicking. Additionally, they're zoning this. So some people I know would just call this uh, pin pull. Fine, whatever. But they've got favorable matchups in here with two inside linebackers walked up. It's a mug look on third and 10, faking uh, multiple player blitz and then dropping guys out. Broncos are anticipating pass, and that's to me what makes this give this gives this multiple levels of excellence when Detroit does use it. Now, I think it's about once every two weeks. And in some cases, I think it, they use it against non-division opponents more. But watch what the center does to 49 and the left guard does to 47. They basically reach them because they've got a favorable matchup. They're not dealing with a defensive tackle. So they've easily been able to get to the play side shoulder. you got the kick-out block here. Montgomery doesn't end up going inside that kick-out block. Excuse me, Gibbs, he ends up going outside of it. I think that's Simmons basically trying to 
a get a gift hold called on on St. Brown by falling down. I do wonder, and I mentioned this a moment ago, if Dan Campbell and Ben Johnson and their staff look for certain teams that are at risk on third down of this being successful against them, but additionally using it when they do so is important to me. And what I mean by that is not just third and five. Hey, every third and five, a third and five on your first possession isn't the same as a third and five or third and ten in this case on your sixth or seventh possession. If we condition you defensively to rush the passer on every third and seven, at some point on the fifth, sixth, seventh possession, we can steal this play because you're used to getting upfield. We've conditioned you. We've created in your head the expectation, the assumption that I'm just going to rush the passer. They don't do this on the opening possession, to my knowledge. It's not just the timing of it being on third down that's important. It's the part of the game at which Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell reveal these things to the defense as well, and I think that's important. I'm not sure if um, other people have covered that. All right, fourth and one against the Chargers. This is where I'm tying together that that first play that I showed from 2022 against the Eagles with with the things that they do on third down. This is actually the last play of the first quarter, third possession. Now, there's there's no threat of the pass here because golf is under center. It is a really cool formation. Uh, still 11 personnel. I may be wrong here. The, the previ- I know that the previous play was a five-yard run by Montgomery, and now Gibbs is in the game. So it's not hurry up, okay? But in any case, it's still 11 personnel. One running back, Gibbs. One tight end, Brock Wright. He's in the same exact alignment he was in on the first play I showed you, and he's going to do the same thing, try to get to the outside knee, outside thigh board of the play side defensive end. You got a little bit of eye candy here. It's an inverted wishbone, I would say, except, look, again, the tight end is closer. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to advance this a little bit, I think, if you're Detroit by running some complimentary plays because at this point, if NFL teams aren't prepared for this in 2024 in fourth and goal, especially down there inside the red zone, I don't know what they're paying attention to. Same exact play as the fourth and one against the Eagles where Swift scored from seven yards out. This one just adds the flavor, I think, of – the tailback Gibbs going opposite flow. And if you're, you know, maybe perhaps you don't watch the all 22 as much as I do. I'll wake up at like three 30 in the morning, and just watch a couple hours and uh, things I'm interested in. You can watch some of this stuff and you can tell what players are reading. So watch this guy's reaction to Gibbs flaring out to this side versus the reaction of everyone else. So you're talking about keys. What are they looking at? and responding to. That's Derwin James just running with Gibbs. So he's either A, assigned to Gibbs, or B, he's the only guy who's got awareness of Gibbs. I think that that's just what he's supposed to key. It's an unusual formation, though. Ben Johnson had never shown it, so I don't suspect that the Chargers were specifically prepared for that. Let's go to the end zone angle here. Look, St. Brown only gets three yards, okay? It's it's a fourth and one. Um, 80. Messes up the front side block a little bit. He, let's, let's put it this way. He ends up on the wrong side of his block. He's trying to pin down the, um, the front side inside linebacker. Really, I believe it's a safety, uh, 32. He's trying to pin him down, prevent 32 from climbing over the top or going underneath such that he can disrupt the play. And what ends up happening is 32 is able to climb over the top, still ends up being a three-yard gain with a better block here. You've got Jackson out in space on the corner. If 80 was able to seal this guy, pin, crack, whatever you want to call it, got a great opportunity for a touchdown, St. Brown along the sideline. I will show you um, a couple of other examples of this concept from the last two years. Most of them are fourth and short, so maybe this doesn't fit for you in the third down runs co- run concepts that I'm showing you. I think they fall under the same umbrella because they're, even though they're different concepts, what I mean is the, the third and long stuff, third and medium, third and long, ends up being trap or counter, whatever you want to call it, most often to the boundary. Fourth and one out of split backs is obviously sweep. I do think there's something to be said that Ben Johnson enjoys running this concept against 5-1 looks. And so moving back to film from 2022 again, another 5-1 look. And what I mean by 5-1 look is three down tackles, defensive lineman, an outside linebacker, Zadarius Smith, another outside linebacker, Daniil Hunter. 
and then one inside linebacker, 54. I forget his name, but he's since moved on uh, to a different team. That's what I mean when I say 5-1. Some people call it 3-3 personnel, but it's not a 3-3 look. It's a 5-1 look. Five of those guys I mentioned are on the line of scrimmage, and one of them is a player, an inside linebacker, who typically lines up off. I think this is a short yardage concept that Ben Johnson knows he can use against 5-1 looks, particularly from 11 personnel. The cool part about this is, remember Brock Wright was the fullback against the Eagles? He was also the fullback on that last play against the Chargers. Well, here he is as the actual tight end now. And you've got Jamal Williams, who's obviously since moved on to the Saints, and St. Brown in the backfield together. Williams is the cut block. He misses Zadarius Smith, but he does miss on the correct side. So what that means is, if you're going to miss your block, if you were to, as Jamal Williams, miss on the inside and Jamal Williams' body end up in here, well, Zadarius Smith can blow up the guard and potentially destroy the flow, the intended path of the play. Additionally, you get the wide receiver pin down. It's Chark on 54, who kind of does run through it, but not until St. Brown is able to get the edge. This really could be St. Brown content at this point with that play and the one that I showed you against the Chargers. How many... 100 catch wide receivers, 90 plus catch wide receivers over a three year period are asked to get in the backfield and run sweep stuff. Not many, if you ask me. Uh, additionally, nobody nobody really identifies this defensive. Well, 44 does. He's in the top right part of the screen. 44 does point at St. Brown in the backfield, but it'll be interesting to me to, me to see who they run this against. Are they going to run it, deploy it against teams um, inside their division? The Vikings, are they going to run it against teams they've already ran this against previously? Or are they going to only run it against teams that haven't seen it before? Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. We'll go back to the one against the Eagles in, earlier in 2022. And so you can see the precise nature of the frontside fullback. In this case, it's Brock Wright on the previous play. It was Jamal Williams. The only guy I see here that even looks like he's identifying this, I think that's C.J. Gardner-Johnson. Again, uh, you, you don't have actually a 5-1 look. You've got a 6-1 look. There's your four down linemen, two stand-up outside linebacker, DNs, if you will, and then one remaining inside linebacker, that's Edwards, who's since moved on to the Chicago Bears. From a personnel standpoint, Doing this with 73, who's a super athletic left guard when he's really healthy, uh, makes a whole lot of sense. Let's move forward to um, conceptually similar play that will look different. This is tackle trap against the Cowboys. So Sewell is going to pull and kick out. And I, I will spend extended time talking about this one. This is a third and three. This is more reasonable rundown for, for some teams in the NFL, clearly. And Sewell's got a long way to go from his uh, right tackle position to kick out the defensive end. But this is a same side run concept. So what I mean is most often, let's, let's do this this way historically, running backs who lined up on the left of the quarterback, most of their run concepts were to the opposite side. A same side run is the running back on the left and running something to the same side where he lined up. It's kind of self-explanatory. This is another 5-1 look, and Dallas is actually stunting away from the running back side. So what I mean by that is all of these guys, Parsons, this D-tackle, and 99 are going to stunt away from the side where the running back is lined up. Additionally, Lawrence, the D-end over here to our right, is going to jam back in here. So what they're really trying to do is clog up this area here. Why? I think they're trying to stop trap. I think they're trying to stop a run concept away from the running back. And that's what I think this is forcing defenses to account for a wider net of plays on third down. It's the third and three, so some would say it's it's not as unpredictable, Coach, and it's also not as risky. I agree, because they're probably still going to go for it on fourth down. The fact that it's a same side run, number one. Number two, that they caught the Cowboys in a stunt, in my opinion, to stop a run concept over here. I think is illustration point number three or four or five, that what they're doing is working, number one. Number two, that Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell are often a step or two ahead. So here's what I mean. Notice these guys stunting this way. 90s feet was out here originally. So they have just jammed up this space here. Well, the Lions are one step ahead. 
kicking out the DN, Montgomery fits inside of it, ends up being an 11-yard gain. What I'm trying to illustrate or what I'm trying to describe is this. The nature of this isn't so simple that it is just, hey, Ben Johnson's making teams defend the run on third and six. Cool. No, I think it goes deeper than that. And maybe I haven't done a good job explaining that initially. Here's what I mean. I think it's, hey, we not only have this run play trap and that run check counter on third down, some of the ones I've shown you, that we're going to make you defend. Now we can bring it over here, and we can run the ball to either side, no matter where the running back lines up. And not only to force you to defend run plays as well as pass plays, pass plays, but also force you to defend run plays to either side. You would not expect that with Jarrett Goff as your quarterback in a typical zone read because he's never going to keep the ball and run to the side. That's just not what Jarrett Goff does. And in my opinion, this is Ben Johnson recognizing we've got to force team to defend, teams to defend run plays here and here, even on third down, without an athletic quarterback. Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. I think it can, I think it can freeze defenses, for real. I think I could be wrong here with with the play calls. And you're more than welcome to let me know if you have a different opinion. There is a there is a concept that I believe in as far as offensive play calls that is the law of diminishing returns. I know it's a, it's a financial a phrase generally. And what it, what I believe my application of it does is try to say the more predictable play calls you have, the less return you're going to get on that investment, the more you use it, meaning under a very limited set of circumstances, if the offense comes out third and two, 21 personnel, and runs power to the strong side, that'll work for a period of time. But NFL defenses will adjust. They'll recognize the situation, and they'll attack. This, to me, this dynamic that Ben Johnson and Dan Campbell are presenting is a different dynamic. And what I mean by that is but what they've done is take a predictable situation, third and six, third and 12, third and eight, third and three, and they've added in at least two elements that expands on what the defense has to account for. And since they can execute those things with different running backs, Gibbs or Montgomery, they can do it to either side out of the shotgun. I think it's all intentional. I think there's some very real math that was done uh, by Ben Johnson and, and maybe an analytics team or whatever. Apparently, Ben Johnson was a math major at North Carolina, and I looked up his player profile, and one of the things that was listed was he's very good at solving math equations, and I thought that was interesting for a guy who was playing football or for any athlete for that matter. And, and then thinking about that in terms of the video that I was creating, um, I also thought was noteworthy as well. This is the first time I've seen this dynamic at the NFL level, and I've only been analyzing the NFL football games for about three, three and a half years at this point. So feel free to let me know if you think I'm overstating the impact. But when you combine Dan Campbell's willingness to go for it on fourth down and the plays that the Lions use on third down, I think has created an offensive situation where it's producing maybe – four to five or maybe even six percent more of everything than it should and what i'm saying is more yards more first downs more points and more wins and and maybe that maybe it's a higher percentage increase because of what they're doing feel free to let me know i don't think these are isolated things meaning dan campbell going forward on fourth down so much and the lions being willing to run the ball on third down so much i think they're related part of it is the byproduct of those two things but I think a lot of it has to do with the high-level exploration and math on the part of Ben Johnson, the Detroit Lions coaching staff, of which Dan Campbell is obviously the biggest part. All right, let's move on to what is probably some people's uh, favorite thing to cover, and that's pass plays. This will be some of the Lions' most widely used or widely successful pass plays on third down. So I will tell you the situation for each. It's a third and two. It's a conversion. Goff uh, sticks this throw in there to uh, St. Brown between two defenders. After the safety moved on the flat route, I'll pause it here in a moment and let you see it. St. Brown's going to motion across, left to right. 
and then he's releasing outside, and so is Laporta. So Laporta is going out into the flats, and then St. Brown's going to sit this thing down behind or outside of this defender. It's a classic concept. Someone in the flats, Laporta, and a snag. In this case, St. Brown ends up being right on top of the numbers. Now, that's a landmark. You teach certain landmarks for receivers, tight ends, and running backs to end up on. And the quarterback knows it. So this is quick trigger by golf. You can see the relationship. This guy's still near him. In fact, I think St. Brown's arm is still maybe touching him a little bit. And golf is firing the ball in there. Quick completion. Think of, think of um, when I say landmark, you may think that that's not that big a deal. Think of trying to practice on a field with no lines. And we've all probably done that as coaches or players at some point. It's a nightmare. Uh, it's a nightmare. I refused to do it one year. I was coaching uh, youth football and high school at the same time, and I would go to the youth practice, and I just I just bought a, a ton of paint and painted lines, you know, painted a 15-yard stretch so we could use it. Um, but using that analogy, no lines, how do you have landmarks? You don't. <laughs> how do you tell someone, uh, this is a seven-yard stop. Well, then you're you're defending on proprioceptive and spatial awareness for someone to to stop at seven yards. Width is also a matter here, and in my opinion, the top of the numbers, the hash, and then the area between the top of the numbers and the hash, is vital to the Lions' offense for two reasons. I think these are landmarks for the Lions' receivers on various concepts, and I think that area I just highlighted right there. Uh, what I would call zone four, is one of Jarrett Goff's favorite places on the field to throw the football to and the one that he's most effective. All right, moving on. This next one's going to be against the Chargers. It's a third and 14. And look, this one's different conceptually. You have you have twins to the field, and the tight end Laporta is motioning down into the boundary. <clears throat> Williams up top is going to run a clear out, and this is pretty much an isolation with, with St. Brown on the slot. I think I'll give you the end zone angle of this one as well. You'll see that Goff confirms that the safety and corner are um, respecting the clear out route by Williams. And once he's got confirmation that those guys are respecting that clear out route, that vertical, he goes to the deep out. St. Brown, beautiful catch, gets the second foot inbounds. Now, I told you, it's third and 14. This is only a 12 yard gain. That goes back to that mentality that Dan Campbell has allowed Ben Johnson to open up a wider set of plays in each situation. This one wasn't a run play, but I showed you enough earlier on to hopefully convince you if you already weren't aware that it's a very real dynamic in the Lions' offense. Same play, end zone angle, by the way. Look, maybe other offensive coordinators don't have that freedom uh, from their head coach, and that's why they don't do it. I think that's a part of it. Goff, looking here in this area, maybe that swath of the field, confirms that the safety and corner are dealing with the vertical by Jamison Williams that you saw on the All-22. Then he hits St. Brown. For 12 yards. Here's why I think this is important. This play is with two minutes left in the tied game. This is pure guts by everybody involved, Goff and St. Brown primarily, to recognize, hey, we're going to run this route at 12 yards with two minutes left in the game because we know we're going to go for it on fourth and two. It's a tie game, 38-38. I guess perhaps maybe some people would say, Coach, it would be different if you were down four. Maybe it would be. But I haven't seen those dynamics occur. One more time from the All-22, and I do want to point one thing out. The route that's down here by Reynolds, uh, it's inconsequential to the play. But I think this is a foundational route for the Lions, and this is where a lot of routes end up, and in some cases are not targeted, but they're complementary to other concepts. So the ball's already out, but you can see that Reynolds doesn't know that, and he's sitting his route down on the hash. To me, that's a foundational route, a landmark, if you will, for the Lions offense on a lot of plays. All right, after that 12-yard gain, we'll go ahead and go through the fourth and two. We're at about 150 left in the game when this ball was caught. On the road, tied at 38, like I said. Run plays are an option here for this offense on fourth and two. Generally, you would say, well, Coach, that's not true because you don't have athletic quarterbacks. There's no way to create conflict. 
meaning the quarterback's not going to keep it on a mesh with the running back and then potentially run around to the opposite direction. That is true. The conflict they've created is conditioning defensive linemen, linebackers, to get upfield and rush the passer and then trap them, which is why I focused on trap and counter stuff. So in any case, this is Laporta settling down between the hash and the top of the numbers. There's the top of the numbers. There's the hash. Laporta's feet settling down almost at the midpoint between them. And where is Reynolds? On the hash. Two landmarks. You also have the running back, in this case Gibbs, releasing into the flats and threatening Derwin James just enough such that Laporta can stop his route in front and find that open lane. You can see the the three receiver nature of this into the boundary. My suspicion here is, and look, Gibbs got jammed up by, I think it's Khalil Mack. Collisions him right here. So that influences the route. My suspicion here is if Gibbs ran, like, let's say, a wheel. If he ran a wheel here, that James, as the curl flat player, would, or perhaps man, would run with that. If you have the flat, you have the wheel anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered at all. And then as a result of that, Laporta's route might have gone ahead and extended towards the sideline instead of settling in there. So when people say it's, it's all read routes, yeah, you're reading man or zone and you're responding to that. Since Gibbs isn't threatening vertically, James stops over the top of the route. Again, it's fourth and two. He's going to try to come downhill and make the tackle. And he's probably aware of the threat from something from the other side. But because James settles there, Laporta also stops his route. Goff pulls the trigger. Quick six-yard gain on a first down inside of two minutes left in the game. We all know how it finished. Lions get a field goal, 41-yarder by our Riley Patterson to close out the game and go to 7-2. and two. All right, moving forward, this one is not nearly as intricate. Just to illustrate that not every third and long uh, concept is one that's designed to get nine yards, though. This is a screen to St. Brown. NFC Championship game, third and nine. St. Brown motions across, and Goff knows it's, it's man over to the boundary, but zone to the other side. So no one follows St. Brown. Now, look, teams later on in the year, particularly the Packers and Bears, did a nice job of, and the 49ers did it twice in this NFC title game as well, of showing man and playing zone, or showing zone and playing man. In this case, it ends up being man to the top side and a zone look down here to the field. St. Brown's catch on the screen is, is easy because there's nobody in his face, obviously. Laporta does a nice job on uh, Chase Young initially to get out and just kind of screen him off. And then Sewell has the right tackle, amazing block on Warner downfield to basically help ensure that he gets the first down. This was early in the game, by the way. St. Brown for a 13 yards, second possession on a third and nine. Lions would go down and make it 14 nothing. reason why I focus on that one for you is on a screen on third and nine, perhaps there's a chance of only getting seven yards. You're only throwing – you're throwing the ball behind the line of scrimmage when you need nine yards to gain. So there's 11 yards differential or maybe 12 at the point where you catch the ball. They're willing to go for it on fourth down. So Campbell's fourth down strategy is willingness and Ben Johnson's playbook, the plays he uses on fourth and one and fourth and two, being so reliable I think is – related to the call before that, if that if I said that in a way that makes sense. Third and 10, same game, obviously, against the 49ers. St. Brown's going to have an easy conversion here, but I do want to point out a down to the bunch side, this, this staggered release by St. Brown as Laporta runs the under. <clears throat> so I'm talking about the release down here of these three guys. Laporta's going to run the under. That he could sit down on the hash, he could sit it down anywhere in here, depending on you know zone versus man. And it's third and ten. Look, the 49ers will give up six yards, right, to make a tackle in front. So since Laporta is lined up outside and releasing under, Sam Brown's inside and he's releasing into the hash. 
between the hash and the top of the numbers. I think Detroit has this route in its play design on a third and 10 because they trust St. Brown to potentially get the first down, but also because they're willing to go for it on the very next play. The dynam- I, In my opinion, they're changing the dynamic, the balance, I should say. They're tilting the balance in their favor on some of these calls. Uh, turns out here they, they get the first down anyway because of a great effort by St. Brown. I think part of that is Goff getting rid of the ball so fast. It puts St. Brown, it allows St. Brown, I should say, space to catch it and make a move because the timing of the throw, the catch, occurred while there was still space there. The, the defense hadn't recovered, if you will. They hadn't closed down. I think, A, that's one of the underrated things about Goff is that he's willing to get the ball out of there quick, and I think that might be related to his coach and offensive coordinator's willingness to go for it on the very next play. Hey, I'll take eight yards on third and ten because I know we're probably going to go for it on fourth and two. I don't think every quarterback is willing to throw that route right there on a third and ten. The trust in St. Brown is a factor. The decision-making by Goff is a factor. The ability to process things quickly is a strength of his. His coach's willingness to go for it on fourth down, I think, just puts it over the top. Hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense or touched on it at least enough to, to kind of tie it all together. Let me know if you think I didn't didn't hit all the marks there. All right, this is a third and two against the Bears. Now, look, the Lions are in 13 personnel. So from the huddle, pre-snap, there's the threat of the run, three tight, three tight ends and one running back on the field. <clears throat> Notice where Laporta catches this football on the hash. But let's talk about what they do pre-snap. So they put Brock Wright and Laporta on the same side uh, with the running back. You would think that you're going to get the tight end motion down and maybe a, a same side run to the side where you have two tight ends, into the boundary. That's what uh, you would presume if you stopped it here and said, what do you think is coming on a third and two uh, for the Detroit Lions? I, that's what I'd say. You get the <clears throat> man after the shift down here on the backside where Laporta is. And like I said, notice where his route ends up settling on the hash, right on the hash. Now, Goff looks um, right to left here. And I think once he sees uh, Brisker take the wheel, once he sees Brisker take this wheel, he knows all I got to do is get this ball around this guy here. And I've got Laporta at the spot and just got to put it in front of him such that Tyreek Stevenson, who I think is going to be a fantastic corner, just can't get around him, essentially like a post-up, if you ask me. That route coming from the other side of the field that I've mentioned earlier clears that linebacker out. Goff here it actually might be getting rid of the ball a split second later than I would normally have expected him. Conversion. I'm going to show this one more time so you can see the routes that I'm talking about that pull players away from the that window, that zone that I talked about, zone four, this area here, between the top of the numbers and the hash. So you've got Gibbs release pulling Brisker out of here. And then simultaneous to that, or a staggered nature, I should say, Brock Wright's route is going to pull, I think that's Edwards out of there, out of the window on the hash. And all Goff's got to have is time to get that ball there. You can see Brisker cleared out of there. Edwards cleared out of there. Goff letting go of the football. Laporta posted up. Boom. First down. Moving on, third and six against the Raiders. Same route that Brock Wright just ran on the previous snap. Sam Laporta runs it. In this case, he gets the football. Now, there's a, some some differences here. First of all, this is late second quarter against the Raiders. It's a drive where the Raiders have just scored, I believe, their only touchdown, offensively, that is. And then the Detroit goes down and answers immediately, throwing the football a lot. But you, first of all, you got quads. you got a bunch of... And the running back, so four by one, meaning four potential receivers to this side, one potential receiver, I think, green down to the bottom side. Laporta is going to run this same route that we've highlighted a couple of times, starting with Josh Reynolds on the play that he did not get the football. And he sits this down between the hash and the top of the numbers. Raiders are dropping out in coverage. As soon as Goff moves his shoulder at all, and I'll let you see the end zone and then come back to the All-22. That's Robert Spillane, who I'm not saying he's supposed to cover Laporta, but it clears open. It makes Laporta even more available 
because Spillane hedges over to that other side. I think that right hash, I think I've established it at this point, that right hash to the top of the numbers is an area, the area, where golf likes to go. You'll see a triangulated nature of the reads here, but here's Spillane, and there's golf. Watch golf's slight little move, and Spillane goes for it. Can't come down onto uh, Laporta at all. Give you the end zone angle of this one. By the way, Spillane, I think, is a, is a much better player than people give him credit for. I thought he played really well for the Raiders this year. I think golf is really good at this. People call it looking defenders off. He's just going through his reads, and I think he is aware of the defenders and how they're going to react. Getting the ball out quick based on a certain read is a strength of his. I don't think he predetermines where the ball is going at all. Let me go back to the All-22 now that you've seen Goff's uh, little shimmy with his feet and how Spillane moved himself out of there or allowed himself to be moved, if you will. Foundational route in this offense, if you ask me, whether it's third and six, third and ten, that's a, a route that Goff is willing to go to and Ben Johnson uses to set up other things. <clears throat> Excuse me, third and 12 against the Seahawks, week two at home. This is fourth quarter. Laporta is going to end up in the same place on the right hash, um, post-snap with his route. This time it's into the boundary after motion to determine that they don't have man. And Laporta ends up, he manages to catch this ball despite contact from uh, Kobe Bryant, who, who uh, that's another guy I think is underrated. And I really think the Seahawks could um, use him more, particularly this year um, as Mike McDonald uh, is the head coach now. But look, Goff makes such quick decisions in terms of what the coverage is and then gets the ball out for, to the route that might be open. Again, I don't think he predetermines even though Laporta and St. Brown get more of the targets, obviously. You can show off and talk about Laporta's individual talents here, how strong he is. He wins despite the contact. So there's there's no route design here to really speak of other than if you want to use a basketball comparison, the, the Lions' power forward was able to post up against a shooting guard or small forward, and Goff got him the ball because he recognized it in a spot where only his power forward could go get it. Third and five against the Packers, week four um, on the road. Big time catch here by Laporta. Nothing to do with the hash here or landmarks because this is just man. Now, how did the Lions know? Well. First, they see the DB motion across when St. Brown goes in, goes in motion, so, so there's that. Sometimes, I know that all teams, but the Lions in particular, have two plays called in the huddle, even if they're pass plays. One route concept they're going to run if it's man, and another that we'll run or utilize if we see zone. Now, the ball is snapped quite quickly here, so I'm not sure that's necessarily the case here. But my point in in describing that to you is I think the Lions are really good at processing things post-snap and pre-snap. They appear to be a smart team, and I think that generally comes from the coach, uh, Ben Johnson, Dan Campbell, and the other offensive staff. Look, it's a great catch by Laporta, so you got to give him credit. This one's designed to get him open in between the hashes, and what I mean by that is once St. Brown motions away, check out the speed of the release by the X, or, or lack thereof, if you will, and then the running back, in this case Montgomery, cutting his route short. And what it does is it just ensures that this area is all open and available for Laporta to run onto. This route I don't believe is being run 100%. I think it's Marvin Jones. I think he knows that he's not going to get the football on this concept, show the end zone angle. The DB does a nice job trying to undercut it, if you ask me, but there's enough, enough push on the football by golf for Laporta to make the catch and, and, and convert it for a 34-yard gain. He's getting held a little bit as well. And when you talk about the margin for error being small in the NFL, look at the path that the ball takes here and then the catch by Laporta. The ball barely goes over a Packers defensive lineman's hands. Right here, the camera's kind of in the way. You can see the coverage relationship that you've got by uh, 21. Douglas, I believe. It's a sick play. There's nothing about route design to really talk about other than the running back and the X clearing out that space because they knew it's man. And then just illustrates the talent 
pre-catch and post-catch for Laporta, the size and strength is ridiculous. Moving forward or backwards, if you will, third and three, week two against the um, against the Seahawks. You got Laporta down here against Witherspoon, inconsequential to this play. I actually could have led off with this one. Like I said, it's a third and three, week two, classic Ben Johnson routes um, here, if you ask me. So, again, clearing out the space up at the top side, uh, a fake wheel by the running back, if you will. And remember, this is man, so the landmarks are less a part of the deal. But you got the same route by Reynolds underneath drag, and then also sitting down here on the hash. I believe that's Marvin Jones. So Jones sits his down on the hash versus man, and then wide open Reynolds running underneath. Goff hits him in stride, eight yards. Like I said, I think this one could have been presented earlier alongside a couple of the routes by Laporta, but you get the idea. Third downs, and oftentimes in these concepts for, for Ben Johnson's offense, you're going to have that underneath cut that could sit down on the hash, sit down between the hash and the numbers, or in the case of Reynolds here against Mann, he's got Julian Love beaten horribly. Just keep on running to the sideline. I think there's more to be said about... Um, about Jared Goff's passing, and I'll try to do that in a later video because I really think he played at an extremely high level this year. An another thing to mention is is it's a five-man rush and how smart I think Goff is in understanding that these guys, these safeties, when there is a five-man rush, they're going to go the first place he looks because they think he's not going to have time to come back to the second route. So he's going with the wheel here, and then that just opens up the space for Reynolds to to get involved, to get to run onto. Uh, brilliant stuff, if you ask me. The read on the run stuff that they do is simple. It's not difficult. And I know the Lions asked their guys to do that, and multiple people have commented, hey coach, that's that's what um that's what the Lions expect their guys to do. Everybody does that. The NFL, college and high school level. I know a high school that asked their receivers to probably adjust 60 to 70 percent of their routes based on the coverage they're seeing. All right, moving forward. Third and 18 here, so a longer time to go. This is a badass route combination here, and Goff just sticks this throw underneath to St. Brown. It's a it's a broken bunch to the top of the screen. So what I mean when I say broken bunch, some people may not refer to it as that. It's not actually a bunch because Laporta is close enough to almost be considered one by one. Really, it's probably one by two. But if his, if it was a real bunch, his feet would be up here closer to those two guys. So when we say broken bunch, we mean you only got two-thirds of the bunch. But in any case, 27 is going to drop down to the hash. The inside linebacker to the boundary is going to basically take the flats. And Goff confirms that 27 is going to go with the deeper vertical, the deeper um, post, excuse me, by Williams. So this guy's going to turn his back and go. And as soon as Goff sees that, as soon as he confirms he's got nothing to the boundary, I'm talking about these two routes here, Remember, it's third and 18. He goes second to the post by Williams. As soon as 27 turns his back, ball is already on its way to being delivered. Boom, St. Brown for 23 yards. There, there is something to be said here about a couple of things, about the inside linebacker play in the flats, which is what, and the safety on the hash, which is what the 49ers are trying to do. Basically, the safety, it's third and 18, so he's not spinning down very far. And then the inside linebacker taking the flats. In a, in a cover three, let's just do it that way. It kind of looks like cover three, but it's a little bit different up to the top, to be honest with you. So normally you'd have the inside linebacker on the hash and maybe a safety spinning down. If an inside linebacker was on the hash, whether it's cover three or whatever, he's rarely going to turn and deal with this post-climb concept to the side. I'm talking about if an inside linebacker was here. He'd probably be at this level. But you want less space for the inside linebacker to cover in some situations, and you want him matched up against a running back as opposed to a receiver. So I get it. This concept, if you ask me, is something that multiple teams use. And I'm not just talking about those two routes together. So I'm not only talking about Williams running the deeper post and St. Brown running the dig underneath of it. I'm talking about this route down here, holding this defender and keeping this defender from getting such depth 
that he could deal with Williams on the post route. A lot of people attack cover three like that. They want to force this corner to check up on the X receiver, and then the post from the other side is a tight alignment. You can only do it from a tight alignment. If Jamison Williams' feet was out here, he's not going to be able to get all the way over to this other side of the field. I really can't draw it you know, the way that it should because I don't have that much width of the field to draw here because of the screen. I think the safeties have more awareness of this route than inside linebackers do. And in this case, the corner is, is almost playing like a cover three. A technique there off. He's not jumping it like he would in man. In any case, Goff recognizes it and is able to get the football out for a 23-yard gain. I think I think it ends up being, yes, some people would call this a half-field read, okay? But I think that's an oversimplification, and it's something that a lot of people do to criticize quarterbacks on teams that they don't like. It is not uncommon to have multiple routes flowing towards one side of the field, basically overwhelming a zone defense or teams that want to play match coverage or quarters coverages. The Chiefs did this a lot against the Ravens in the AFC title game, basically four strong, four receivers ending up on one side of the field. At home against the Packers, loss on Thanksgiving Day. This is a third and two. This is the same aforementioned route that I talked about, the drag by the outside receiver, but it's kind of stacked here. You can see, but the, but the release here confuses the Packers on some level. It's basically manned by everybody, except because of the drag by Raymond, 35 releases him inside. No one picks him up. It's a 20-yard gain. Conceptually, somewhat similar to the previous play, you have Williams on a on a little bit over on an over route and Raymond on the under, but it, it, those two routes aren't run at the same depth as the one I just showed you. Where if it was run from the side of the field, which we know it was not, Williams was running the post and St. Brown was running the dig. Conceptually similar in that you have two routes being run from the left side of the field over to the right side, both flowing in the same direction. I think that route being available for golf against man or zone is important because it's oftentimes the third part of the read, and because he gets through stuff so quickly, it, I think, gives the Lions more options on their third down pass plays because golf's strength is getting through the reads quickly, and all the receiver, whoever's running that route, has to do is read man or zone. In this case, Raymond reads man and keeps running. He's only been released by 35 because of the drag. You got man everywhere else, and no one picks him up, whether it's the inside linebacker's fault or 35 was supposed to run with him, which it certainly looks like he should. It's a third and two conversion. And look, there's different coverages that, that you face that force those guys to adapt that route. My point in showing it constantly to you is I think it's a foundational route that they make available for golf on third downs as the third part of the read, maybe the second sometimes, um, to go to when maybe the other first two routes aren't available. All right, this last one, just to show you how quickly the lines adapt. And look, forgive me for this video going on so long. I knew that it was going to be a long video. Let me know if it's too long. Uh, feel free. Third and 10, NFC title game. This one, I think, the 49ers are trying to drop into a Tampa 2. I know uh, people, some people would not call this a Tampa 2. But you have a couple of, of the common themes here. By the way, I think the Lions go for it on the ensuing fourth down, and this is one of the times when they, um, uh, they don't get it. But you have this in-out nature between um, Laporta and Reynolds. It ends up down here at the bottom side of the screen. So we'll let that flow. There's Reynolds on that same route that I'm talking about, and then Laporta from this side running the in. The in-out nature of a lot of these routes that are complementary, even though in this case they end up kind of being in the same line as golf releases the football very, very quick. That route by Reynolds, same route as the previous play I showed you, Raymond's drag against the Packers at home where he got 20 yards. The same one Reynolds caught against Mann against the Seahawks in Week 2. I'm forgetting a couple of other ones, but hopefully you guys get the point. Laporta's route is supposed to complement it, but let's get to the coverage because I know other people are going to have different names for it. It's a three-safety structure by the 49ers. I believe this is a Tampa 2. 
So one safety is going to drop out to halves. Another safety is going to drop out to halves. And then this safety right here is just going to sit. Basically, he becomes the Mike linebacker in old school Tampa 2. Normally, that Mike linebacker would be reading pass and turning and running with some type of vertical to protect between the two hashes. Tampa 2 is really uh, mislabeled. It's, it's really three deep coverage with the Mike linebacker. In this case, San Francisco, I think, is accomplishing this task with a three safety structure. Now, let's get to uh, the underneath droppers. Tells you how quickly golf processes things. This is the flat defender. This is the flat defender, if you believe that this is a Tampa 2. If it is, that flat defender at the top side of the field should be a little more shallow once St. Brown catches this football. But again, it's third and 10. So he's trying to defend the sticks and not let this route get over top of him such that Goff can throw it. Watch how quickly Goff processes it and gets the ball out into an area that on paper should be covered. But again, I think it's because it's third and 10, that guy's playing these route, these route combinations a little bit deeper down there versus the corner on the bottom side who has no work. He's got a vertical release by one. Talking about this player here and this guy here. A lot of times people take snapshots. This is Tampa 2. Why is one corner deeper than the other? Well, he only has one receiver to deal with, and it's a vertical release, so he's pushing him inside, and then he's going to settle in his flat area. This guy has a whole heck of a lot more to deal with with two or potentially three receivers to his side, plus his third down. He saw golf reading that side, so he gave up the shorter completion. It worked out in San Francisco's favor. You also have a really nice blitz pickup <clears throat> down at the bottom side of the screen by Montgomery against Greenlaw. Uh, stones him. Now, now look, Greenwald does end up knocking <laughs> knocking Montgomery off balance, but it's same foot, same shoulder, more power from the standpoint of Montgomery and pad level, trying to stand his ground and not let Goff get hit. Goff is getting rid of the ball really quick. Beautiful stuff. That's my uh, take on their third down pass concepts. Some of the, their more favorite ones. Maybe I didn't cover all of the ones that you would um, have me focus on, to be real. I think I'd like to create a playlist on my YouTube for my most focused Lions offense content, meaning when I've tried to explain what I believe they're doing, and certainly there's other people out there that understand it way better than me, I want to put those things as a playlist, and if you want to check out the entire playlist or share the playlist on show, somewhere on social media, go right ahead. But in any case, this video will definitely be included, as well as uh, future videos about Ben Johnson's offense in Detroit. I don't know about you. I feel blessed to get to watch it for a third season. Well, really a second for me. Because I didn't really start categorizing and and saving Lions uh, videos until uh, just after Thanksgiving 2022. So I've got about a, a year and a half worth of data on, on his offense. Um, this first one was third down runs and third down pass concepts that they rely on. Maybe next time, I think I'm going to, it's going to take a two week turnaround on this one, at least 10 days maybe. <clears throat> It'll be um, the Lions base run plays and the complementary play action passes that are built off of it. I don't know if that's what people would prefer to see, but I've got to kind of go off my own understanding and organization to to create content that's hopefully structured. And here's what I mean by that. This is, this is how I save and label plays um, in order, obviously, um, alphabetically on the left so, you, so that the plays will flow in my video player in the order that I want them to flow. Additionally, with some information uh, available to me so I can see it down in distance and then who got the football in the game, et cetera. And then it's my job while we're going through this, and I do this in one take, by the way, uh, to be able to recall what I want to say and recall uh, the plays. So there's significant um, input on the front end for me uh, to get these to get these produced, not with just the, the labeling of the plays, the, the folders like you see, but also what I'd like to say to you guys. So my apologies if you were um, waiting too long on this video and then turns out that it gave you over an hour of a video about this. I'm going to do the same thing for the Ravens and, and probably the Texans. Those are the, the three offenses I want to familiarize myself with the most. They are the three that I find the most interesting uh, with the Lions offense at this point for me in terms of level of interest and challenging me to understand things being, being the number one. In any case, I appreciate you guys' time, man. Let me know what you thought of the video. 
if you were waiting for Lions content and you thought it was too long, my apologies again. The detailed film studies in the off-season, long-form content, I think is the way to go. If I'm going to dedicate the time, I'm going to put something out that will hopefully hold people's attention and bring some flavor to the analysis of the Lions offense and their defense for that matter that hopefully people want to hear or maybe new or interesting slant or perspective that you haven't heard yet. If uh, you like what I presented to you here today, please let me know in the comment section. Consider sharing it out on social media to, to A, help this content get more reach, and B, allow more Lions fans to lay eyes on it and get exposed to my content if you think that they would be interested as well. Appreciate you guys' time.